Joining us now on The Damage Report, senior politics editor for The Intercept, Brianna Joy Gray. Brianna, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, glad to have you here. We've been wanting to talk to you for quite some time and uh, we've got a couple of topics that uh, I can't wait to, to drill down into with you. Uh, first, Ralph Northam, we're a couple of weeks out from the breaking of his scandals uh, surrounding his uh, use of blackface at least once in his past. And it kind of seems like he's he slipped through and he's not gonna step down and Consequences seem slight, if at all. Uh, what is your take on this? Do you think that he has largely avoided any sort of responsibility or consequences for this? It seems like it. I mean, polls were showing that a majority of African Americans in the state actually did not want him to resign. Um, and I think that the part of the problem here is that the choices being set up are overly binary. You know, I, I wrote an article in which I suggested that the issue shouldn't be whether or not he resigns, but whether or not he is able and, in fact, does follow through on acts of actual um, um, uh, re re repent repenting, right? Uh, and that repentance comes before absolution. I think in a lot of these uh, conversations, you end up having to choose between canceling someone outright um, and accepting them as they are. And the conversation about what actually constitutes a apology, which actually is meaningful and actually makes the distinction between who the person is today and who they were then is lost. And that's why a lot of people feel unfulfilled either way uh, the outcome uh, manifests. Uh, yeah, and I found the nuance in your piece to be a great addition to this conversation lost in most of the discussion around it. So uh, let, let's talk about um, your analysis of potential repentance and atonement. In a case like this, what could that look like? Um, so Northam says he's going on this uh, apology tour. I said, he doesn't call it an apology tour, he calls it a reconciliation <laughs> tour. And the first stop of that tour uh, was supposed to be today, except it was canceled by the student who preferred that he not um, come to this event, which was honoring, I believe, people who had um, participated in a sit-in uh, to desegregate uh, in the 1960s. I, I think that this is a really great example of the kind of event that actually isn't especially helpful. I understand why students might have chosen to ask him not to come, because at the end of the day, this is a place where to, this was a circumstance in which he was being asked, or, or which students were trying to honor people who had you know, participated in, and been um, furthered civil rights interests in the past. This isn't necessarily a, a place for him to come and have a conversation about his own personal failings. Yeah. I think that the idea that he is going to be newly exposed to the reality of um, racial uh, injustice in the past and that that is going to change his mind is a bit naive. The issue isn't that he is completely ignorant about civil rights struggles or the history of an, an, uh, racial inequality in this country, is that he needs to participate in more conversations about um, how that kind of discrimination manifests today and why exactly it is that people are uncomfortable with someone who has done so little reckoning, um, having so much control over the fates of uh, a largely uh, black, very diverse population uh, in Virginia. Brianna, I really appreciate your uh, conversation that you're raising about nuance. And there seems to be a different nuance in the Attorney General's apology for a similar circumstance. Can you talk to us a little bit about how that's translated locally versus the Northam apology tour? Yeah, I, I think that there was, for first and foremost, uh, a kind of unequivocal acceptance of what he had done. Part of what was so frustrating about Northam's apology was that it was followed by kind of a retraction where he says, well, I'm not actually in the picture, although I did darken my face on another occasion to dress up as Michael Jackson, and it kind of blurred the waters. The first step has to be an unequivocal acceptance and acknowledgement of what it is that you had done, which we did get um, with the Attorney General's apology. There also seemed to be a greater understanding of why it is that blackface is bad, which is something that I think even the media has failed to cover um, with sufficient detail, and I wanted to take the time in my article to try to help people to under to to understand that even if Northam wasn't dressed in kind of stereotypical blackface, the kind of blackface that we associate with the particularly craven vaudevillian acts that was making an express mockery of African Americans, even if he was you know just uh, I put that in quotation marks <laughs> dressed as um, a, a pop singer, uh, that is still bad. And the idea that he kind of put that forward as though that was um, that absolved him 
at least substantially absolved him of his crimes was really short sighted and speaks to the fact that he doesn't understand that even if you don't, I, I do think it's less bad. But the point of the matter is that you are ignoring the, the histor historical legacy or ignorant of the historical legacy about worst kind of blackface, which is why um, dressing as, as even black famous people carries um, such a, a, a negative social valence. And so I want to talk a little bit more about things that he might not understand because the act that he's alleged to have done, the you know appearing in blackface at that point, what he definitely did, which is using that picture in his yearbook and admitting that he had done blackface, some people will say, well, that's a while ago. Um, but on CBS, I mean, he called slaves indentured servants, which sort of implies that there is not just historic ignorance, there is lingering ignorance up until a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, um, that was certainly pretty disappointing. Look, I, in a lot of ways, I think that the inclusion of the photograph in the yearbook is one of the most galling aspects of this because it speaks to the broader um, institutional and structural acceptance of this kind of behavior. And in fact, there were a couple of stories that followed that uh, where people had found similar images in other yearbooks, which really speaks to the fact that we are talking about a much larger cultural problem than just Northam. Now that cuts both ways. The fact that this is in fact a cultural problem says that, that um, you know punishing Northam as an individual isn't really getting to the bottom of this. There is a world in which uh, we, we end up with all of the people who simply have photographic evidence of their bad deeds are are dismissed and everyone who was kind of savvy enough to keep it under the radar gets to hold huh. office and is never like forced to reckon with their past deeds. I think that this really does present an interesting opportunity to, to, to dialogue with someone who we know because of photographic evidence has transgressed in the past, but is in a position to actually have the tough conversations um, about what it like why racism matters that are very infrequently actually had publicly.